And so this is a uh, five minute Shakespeare. <laughs> or five minute Hamlet. Yeah. <laughs> Very short. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit is intersubjectivity. Intersubjectivity seems to be in the air. Last night, uh, Ed and Sarah talked about jazz and intersubjectivity, uh, which I was very keenly interested in. And Robin um, Brown, who I'm standing in for right now, was actually going to give us a paper um, on post uh, analytic <coughs> intersubjectivity. Uh, post Freudians are one of the groups that have gotten interested in intersubjectivity. Unfortunately, uh, you can't, if you're an English speaking person, it, 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 you probably can't read it. Uh, <laughs> actually, believe it or not, Husserl, this is very informal. And, uh, Husserl was interested in intersubjectivity, it was part of his phenomenology. And uh, Heidegger, was also shifted the emphasis from epistemology to being. Uh, and then we, we go down to the existentialist, uh, Martin Buber, uh, and that, I mean, that's really about intersubjectivity. When you uh, read Buber and you think about what he, he was talking about. So I'm working on a paper on intersubjectivity. It's the third in a series of sort of uh, Serious silly paper is the first one is on the scope of consciousness studies. Now, they're all free available, by the way, on uh, Amazon, or not Amazon, I mean uh, academia.edu. Academia. Academia. Uh, and uh, then there's one that you may have seen called Consciousness, the Damnedest Thing, the Young Person's Guide to the Original Experience, obviously from the music piece. Uh, and this is the most recent one, Consciousness, Collective Consciousness, Enlightenment, and Collective Enlightenment. And the reason I have this title and this topic is I was invited along with Irvin and some others to uh, contribute to a journal, expanded online journal, you can find it, uh, articles on collective consciousness. And I asked the editor what's that. He said, I don't know, I'm going to read the article to find out. So I have no idea what the other people are writing about. <laughs> I didn't know myself. Uh, but I did a little Googling and collective consciousness can, well, let's start with consciousness. Then what we got is four fuzzy sets here. We got consciousness, we got collective consciousness, we got enlightenment, and collective enlightenment. So I'll just rattle on a little bit about that. And Jonathan tells me I shouldn't lecture, that I should be available for our interruption. So maybe he'll interrupt. Uh, Jonathan. Right here. Oh yeah, well I'm waiting for you to interrupt. <laughs> so, consciousness, what is it? Uh, that's a real fuzzy set, and I <laughs> stick to the simplest definition uh, I know of, and it's not one anybody else has really used uh, so far in the conference, and that's the old, uh, what it's like, you know, it was a nagel. So what it's like to be a bat, you wrote this article. It's like uh, something, we don't know what, but it's like something to be a brown bat, like nothing to be a baseball bat. So, so, a real basic definition of consciousness is what it's like to be here, right now, sitting in that chair, tasting whatever you're tasting with your mouth or not tasting, so this is what it's like. If you weren't conscious, the chair's not conscious. It's not like anything to be that chair, but it's like something to be you. So this is a fundamentally subjective definition of consciousness, and David goes on to write that anybody who writes about consciousness <laughs> and leaves out the subjective dimension is, well, it's kind of crazy, but I'm not going to do. Uh, so, that's my definition, what it's like, very simple idea of consciousness, that's what I'm going to use, not fussy about it. Now, what could collective consciousness be? Well, it's got something to do with what it's like to be collective part of the group. Well, if you just Google collective consciousness, it has a number of possible meanings. Uh, the first thing you come up with is social definitions. Collective consciousness, for example. Uh, increasing awareness, uh, a public opinion about it. Collective uh, women's uh, rights, for example. Collective consciousness about women's rights or uh, or social issues, and so there's this collective 
idea of consciousness is uh, basically social or about values. And that, that's the one you'll mostly see. Uh, as I said, Husserl and Heidegger both uh, included collective consciousness in their phenomenologies, but unfortunately they're inscrutable, at least to me. Now, is uh, uh, anyone here that can read them? This lady over here, she can read Husserl and phenomenology. Yeah, uh, Husserl and Heidegger, and uh, my hat's off to you as a matter of fact. But uh, they, they dig into this a little bit. And so uh, there is this tradition in phenomenology that comes down to existentialism in the 60s, where you find Martin Luther and I and that, the mention of I and that. When, when you're in an I and thou relationship, uh, I think you can say you're truly in an in, inner uh, subjective uh, experience. You're in an experience that actually shared. Now, what does that mean? It's, you know, what you can talk about this a little bit. If you listen to a piece of music with your best friend, you both like it if you had a shared experience. If you both become totally absorbed in the music together, uh, totally absorbed, and then have a shared experience. If you make love and you can't find the place where your body's in, the next body starts, you see the usual <coughs> state of love pleasure or ecstasy, actually, this would happen to you mostly after the orgasm. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I know <laughs> you've experienced this, and I have too, where you, you, you just have no sense of separation. Is that uh, intersubjective? Well, I would think of that as intersubjective. So I'm looking around for examples of intersubjectivity uh, other places in the literature, not much literature about it, uh, it turns out there are a number of cultures that talk about uh, seem to experience intersubjectivity. Uh, if you look at my paper, you'll see an example of an Amazonian culture that has collective visions. They're perhaps facilitated or infeasible facilitated, but they sit in a circle and uh, these animals come parade through, jaguars, eagles, and so on, and everybody sees them, the collective vision. So that, that seems to be collective consciousness. Also, the Bushmen of Africa uh, report collective experience, all their state experiences, where they go to what's called the library or the school, you know, and they get traditional knowledge. So, how does a culture like that carry detailed traditional knowledge over decades and generations? Uh, they, they go to the school, bring it back and go together. Do you have a question? Uh, can I ask you, when you say intersubjectivity, you know, and, and where boundaries um, seem to dissolve. In terms of like the random uh, number generator, like when 9-11 happened or when Princess Diana t uh, died, the, the numbers all that were random were no longer it random. It a field effect, didn't it? W would that be considered Same thing happened with the Titanic some As a matter of fact, there were newspaper reports about it before it even happened. Wow. But that kind of takes us off into something. But is more. that intersubjectivity or no? Uh, I would not say it is. Well, it is. It's it. somehow shared knowledge. And it's collective. Maybe some shared experiences. Uh, okay. When I talk okay. about intersubjectivity, how many Quakers? <laughs> I've been. Okay, I am among other things a Quaker, Eastern Quaker, <laughs> and if you sit in a Quaker meeting and you are lucky enough to experience what's called a gathered meeting, have you experienced a gathered meeting? I have. Yeah. You just suddenly you're part of the whole group, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. You're just part of the group. It's a, it's a powerful experience. I don't mean it's like real super. You just know it and. Everybody in the Quaker house will look at each other and say, whoa, that was a gathered meeting. Okay, well, gathered meeting is an intersubjective experience, and uh, it's not, you know, it's not super charged or anything else, it's just real. And so, that's what I mean by intersubjectivity. There are certainly fields that are uh, relevant to that, and I talk about them some in, in my article. Okay, so, I'm interested in the nature of intersubjectivity, we have a philosopher out there, many of you read Christian Quincy, he wrote a book called Radical Knowledge, in which I think he makes a wonderful case, and we heard this yesterday, that we all live in intersubjectivity all the time, just like fish live in water. 
nothing spooky about it. It's just that we somehow we have notes. We're like a fish, we just have notes. <laughs> and I think there's some truth to that. There's some truth to the fact that we all are living in an intersubjective inner universe or inner outer universe, and we just largely aware of it. So we have to kind of wake up to it. You know? So I have some quotes here by William James and others, but. Uh, well, I don't know that I should talk anymore about it. That's what I'm interested in. There's been relatively little really done on it that I know, but at least Cindy stuff. I would like to explore more deeply. Yeah. Um, uh, I appreciate the idea of, of uh, intersubjectivity. By the way, your word is inter or in inert? Inter. Inter, inter yeah. you're saying. Okay. Um, do you know of any studies showing parallel or, or coherent? Brain action between people having an in, in, in Well, I don't know what they're experiencing, but there's a researcher in Italy that I know fairly well. We keep trying to translate his work into English, but I don't read Italian, he doesn't read English. But he, for years, has been putting people that are close to each other, you know, not close, meditating, and he's even published a book. Uh, and you can see that EDG just in a perfect synchrony. First time I saw it, I told my wife, uh oh, he's got a grounding problem. I don't know if he knows what he No, I've seen a lot more of it, and he does this all the time. What's his name? So we've heard some, I can't even say the Italian. You have to get in touch with him. He's a part of the Urban Lattice Local Group in Italy. Uh, now, I don't think he's looked into the phenomenology of that, and we've heard some, already some discussion of people meditating together. And then this whole business of coming into heart and heart variability in your group, especially, uh, uh, what's his name? Mikey. Mikey. Mikey has been working with heart variability in groups. So I'd be interested in knowing how, how much they come together. I, in fact, we heard it in the movie last week. <clears throat> whether that it reaches a phenomenological level. Um, I just have a question here. I like them. Talks about dual consciousness. Gary. Gary Lachman. Well, there is what's called dual consciousness in which you kind of experience two things at once. So I know we're going to be working on same thing. <laughs> no, but, but we're going to be working on poetry again. So yes. do you think, and looking over again, same thing with music. So can the poet and the reader experience well, that's a good question. Hmm. We'll have to figure that out. That'd be cool, right? That's interesting. Hmm. What about the Nuremberg rallies or uh, Lot concerts? Well, that's an interesting question, too, because uh, as Carl Jung wrote about this group mind, and in the rise of the Third Reich, of course, we got the shadow of the book. Both uh, Jung and uh, Maria von Franz, his great student and colleague, said people in Germany changed individually became more mean-spirited, mm -hmm. uh, stingier, angrier. Hey, that's going on in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed? Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so that you would call that a collective shadow, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how that stands on the designer's subjectivity, but it's not as not important. Yeah. Sartre, in Being a Nothingness, he has a whole little chapter on we subjectivity. His example, he said was writing in a cafe, and there's an accident, like a car accident, outside the window, and then everybody in the cafe, in that moment, is like sharing a subjectivity, because we're all experiencing oh, That's really interesting, you know, even though I can't read this or over Heidegger, I have read a lot of Sark. Yeah, he's, he's more fun to read. Uh, that's very bad. And I, uh, I can't even read it in French, so. But after Nazi, that I have read with Sark. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, one more question. Um, yeah, just to add a, a comment on this. Um, I would um, actually, Magdalena brought up the, the, the random number of generators, and I would say that is an indication of inner subjectivity. And I think a key, uh, you know, the thing I brought up last night was what, what I call the second, the second tier hard problem. Um, does inner subjectivity, is it epiphenomenal to individual consciousness or is it primordial? Yeah. Now, now, Christian De Quincey, of course, would say it's primordial, right. Right, as I would too. So, looking at this, uh, what I would say is the the field consciousness 
uh, and, and there's a ton of research that is that's coming out. You know, Dean and uh, Roger Nelson, people in the SSA group, and uh, they're actually here in a couple of weeks. Uh, that suggests something in the primordial uh, dimension of intersubjectivity. And what I'm hearing you're discussing um, in terms of experiences, people's experiences could be interpreted from both perspectives. You, you yeah. could say, um, you, know, you talk about the love making and, and, and that kind of thing. That could be that could be viewed as, well, yes, there is intersubjectivity, but it's it's um, epiphenomenal, and somehow when individuals tune in, um, somehow you know this is a collective emergent property that that you know, and and I I would say there's um, from my standpoint there's something like that happens, but I think that happens against I think mean, it's huge against a backdrop of uh, primordial. Intersubjectivity well, in, in the cosmos. I'm wondering what you're talking about then when you have lunch. In William James' day, people were studying consciousness even more deeply than they are now, except in the lab. And William James and uh, uh, Frederick, uh, what's his name, Myers in Europe, and other great psychologists at the time, almost all of them, uh, believed in cosmic consciousness. He used the term, uh, again, William James, I have a quote in my paper, but it's time for lunch, but uh, William James uses this metaphor, as many of you heard, the trees are separate in the forest, they whisper to each other from the between the leaves and the trees, but underneath their roots are entwined, the and then he moves on to a second metaphor of uh, islands connected together in the sea floor, part of the same story. And then he refers to it as collective consciousness. So uh, back in James Day, the idea of a root collective consciousness was almost widely, a uh, very widely accepted. There are some was another one. Uh, my own opinion, and you can argue with me, is that a lot of this talk today about non-dual experience is simply a modern way to rediscover collective consciousness. Uh, what I just said, cosmic consciousness. Yeah.